This is a short video on antiplatelet medications versus anticoagulant medications. I'll be talking about the mechanisms of actions of both of these groups, as well as major and common examples from these groups, as well as some important details for each of these examples. This is all the information on the slide, and I'll be fading it out and going through it all line by line. So first, before we begin, this is a diagram of the coagulation cascade. You can see that there's a number of factors here in the coagulation cascade that are impacted by platelets. And in the end, you have fibrin, which is what makes up clots with the platelets. Antiplatelets in general block this portion of the coagulation cascade, whereas anticoagulants block some of this portion. And the actual details are sometimes important, um, and some of that is listed in the descriptions. So let's start with antiplatelets. And if you remember nothing else from this slide, know that antiplatelets in general block platelet activation, aggregation, or thrombus formation. And it's used in the management of cardiovascular events like MIs, heart attacks, and CVAs, strokes. It's also used in the prophylaxis of heart attacks and strokes. Anticoagulants, on the other hand, impact the coagulation cascade, as we mentioned, to prevent or reduce coagulation of blood, and they're used for treating and preventing embolic events, like venothromboembolisms. And that includes DVTs, deep vein thromboses, and PEs, pulmonary embolisms. So prevention and treatment of heart attacks and strokes, antiplatelets. Um, treatment and prevention of DVTs and PEs, use anticoagulants. So now, let's go through them one by one. One of the antiplatelets, and probably the most commonly used one, is the irreversible COX inhibitor, that's cyclooxygenase inhibitor aspirin, also called anti-salicyclic acid, or ASA. This is used for acute coronary syndrome, so myocardial infarctions, NSTEMIs, and even unstable angina. Um, it's also used for ischemic strokes and prevention of cardiovascular disease, so exactly what we've said before. Side effects that are worth knowing, aspirin can cause a respiratory distress, kind of like a cold or an asthma attack style uh, respiratory distress. In children, it can cause Ray syndrome, which is a type of liver, liver damage induced by aspirin. It can upset your stomach, like many of the other NSAIDs. It can um, cause ulcers and just make your stomach feel pretty bad. When you take too much of it, you can have salicylate toxicity, which is a uh, type of, uh, which, which is something, which is an acidosis in the body. It's one of the mud piles, one of the um, anion gap acidoses in the body. And too much of it, of course, can damage your kidneys since it is processed by the kidneys. The other major category of antiplatelets are the P2Y12 antagonists. These are also ADP receptor antagonists. So that's adenosine diphosphate antagonists. All of these have the letters GREL in them, G-R-E-L. So clopidogrel is probably the most common, presugrel, ticagrelor, and cangrelor. So some of these have GREL in the middle of the word, some of them end in GREL. Indications for this are that they're usually used in conjunction with aspirin, with ASA, in acute coronary syndrome. So in STEMIs, in NSTEMIs, and in unstable angina. When they're used together, it's called dual antiplatelet therapy. So these are great. Sometimes they're used as alternatives to aspirin in people who have GI upset, who have kidneys that can't handle them. But um, in general, they are used either as alternatives, but more commonly in conjunction for dual antiplatelet therapy. Side effects here are a little less common, a um, little less high yield to know, but they can cause allergic reactions. They can cause hemorrhage. I guess everything on this slide can really cause hemorrhage since everything thins your blood. And they can also cause GI upset. Uh, maybe the least commonly used of this list are the GP glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors. Um, these are listed here. Um, Epsiximab is, I think, the most commonly used of this group. The indication here is for high-risk patients with unstable angina or NSTEMIs before they undergo percutaneous interventions. So before people get stents um, in high-risk patients, they might get one of these GP2B3A inhibitors. Side effects are thrombocytopenia, they can drop your platelets, and like everything else here, hemorrhage. Next, anticoagulants. So we're moving away from the heart attack and stroke blood thinning drugs, and we're going over to the venothromboembolism, or deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism drugs. 
The oldest, the most classic, um, maybe still the most commonly used, is the vitamin K antagonist warfarin. There's another one in this group called fenprocumon, um, less commonly used than warfarin. The mechanism here is that they inhibit vitamin K epoxide reductase, which is in the process of making vitamin K usable to make these coagulation factors. So by inhibiting this enzyme, epoxide reductase, you're going to decrease carboxylation and reduce the effectiveness of factors 2, 7, 9, 10, as well as proteins CNS. So 2, 7, 9, 10, protein CNS. Remember that. That's what vitamin K affects. The pros, the upsides of using warfarin are that it's cheap, it's well established, we understand the pharmacokinetics um, pretty well, it's easy to reverse, specifically with prothrombin complex concentrate or fresh frozen plasma, FFP. The downsides are that even though we understand exactly how it works, it's still difficult to manage. So your vitamin K levels in your body aren't super stable, they can fluctuate with your diet. For instance, if you eat a bunch of lettuce one week and not the next, that can change the effectiveness of your warfarin dose. So you do need regular monitoring with PT INR blood test. And this is something that people typically go to their PCPs for, and they check the effectiveness of uh, the vitamin K agonists of warfarin. It also requires bridging. So um, it decreases the production of new coagulation factors. And by the way, these are all pro-coagulation factors, 2, 7, 9, and 10, but protein CNS are um, actually anticoagulant factors. So they have the opposite effect of 2, 7, 9, and 10. So you, and these actually have a shorter half-life, protein CNS. So you definitely want to bridge when you start somebody on warfarin. So that'll be putting them on a week or two of some other anticoagulant while the warfarin takes effect. That's another major downside. That's something else you have to think about. Um, this is also an oral medication. These are also oral medications, um, unlike the heparins that we'll talk about at the end. So maybe that can be another pro as well, the fact that it's an oral medication. You don't need injections for it. One last downside of warfarin is that it interacts with the cytochrome P450 enzymes. That's the CYP enzymes. This is essentially a metabolism in the liver, but there are a lot of other drugs that interact with these enzymes as well. So if a patient takes two of these medications concurrently, it might change the effectiveness of the medications um, based on how those medications are cleared from the liver. So that's enough on warfarin. It's a very well-established drug, um, and it has some pros, like being cheap, uh, but it has some difficulties in management as well. Next, we'll talk about the direct oral anticoagulants. Sometimes these are called DOACs, this pair. There's direct oral thrombin inhibitor. This is dabigatran, and the reversal here is this monoclonal antibody. There's also direct oral factor XA inhibitors. So all of these have the letters XA in them. So apixaban and rivaroxaban. Um, the reversal here is adexanat alpha. And the pros of these are that they're easy to manage. They work like heparins. You don't need this bridging step. You don't need this regular monitoring as, uh, as frequently as you see it done with warfarin. The downsides are that they are expensive, um, and you cannot use them specifically in patients with heart valves that are artificial or valvular AFib. So they don't play nicely with heart valves. Um, so, but really, they're easier to use, but they're more expensive than warfarin. So um, if you don't have insurance, you're probably going to be using warfarin in the United States. Um, if you do have insurance that covers these, you're in luck. Apixaban and rivaroxaban are great. Lastly, these are the non-oral anticoagulants. So these are the heparin class of drugs. So first, we'll, and in general, unfractionated heparin is the biggest of them all. Uh, low molecular weight heparin is a little smaller, and synthetic heparin or fondaparinox is even smaller. The mechanisms for all of these are pretty similar. They all enhance the activity of antithrombin in some way. Um, first, unfractionated heparin, the antidote for that medicine is protamine sulfate. You do need to monitor heparin in some cases, not as frequently as warfarin again, but you monitor it with APPT, sorry, APTT, which is um, the other side of the coagulation pathway to PT INR. Um, a benefit of heparin is that it has a short half-life and it's cleared hepatically. The short half-life is nice because if you um, put a patient on heparin and you notice that they have a bleed or you notice that they're bleeding into some part of their body or out of the body, you can stop the heparin drip immediately and the remaining heparin in the, in the body will go away pretty quickly. They won't have thin blood for that long. So that's actually a benefit as long as you're um, keeping an eye on the patient and making sure they're not bleeding or their blood status isn't dropping. 
Next, low molecular weight heparin. This is enoxaparin and deltaparin. This is also sometimes abbreviated as LMHW. Antidote here is still protamine sulfate, although it is a little less effective. I think it only has around 50% effectiveness. And this one is cleared renally. So sometimes your choice between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin is uh, whether the patient has liver damage or kidney damage. Of course, if they have liver damage, you might not want to use unfractionated. If they have kidney damage, you might not want to use low molecular weight heparin or anoxaparin. Lastly, the synthetic heparin, fondaparinox, as I mentioned earlier, the antidote here is activated prothrombin complex concentrate. And um, this one has a slightly smaller effect than the other two because it is so small, but it still is able to um, anticoagulate the blood. I hope this overview of antiplatelets and anticoagulant drugs was helpful, and I hope it helps you differentiate between the two. Again, in general, remember that antiplatelets are for management and prophylaxis of cardiovascular events, like um, MIs and CVAs. Anticoagulants are for treatment and prevention of embolic events, like venothromboembolisms, DVTs, and PEs. Thank you for listening. I hope this was helpful. Goodbye.